Here we are. Shall we? Shall we say <laughs> cheers? Cheers. Oh, Laura. Okay, we'll just wait wow. until Laura finishes. I mean, you haven't had any time to prepare for this, obviously. We're literally in Laura's house, waiting for her to get a drink. Um, she just shot at the last one, I think. Was she did, she did. Yeah, She's yeah. been like, well, after she did that keg stand. Um, <laughs> Laura is pouring the Jack, the sound of Jack pouring in there. And now, wait, 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 wait. wait. Next, next steps. <laughs> God damn. Oh my, wow. you are so fucking weak. <laughs> <laughs> Laura was legitimately struggling to open a can of Coke. Are you alright, friend? Do you want to eat some, like, meat? <laughs> <laughs> oh. oh, there we there go. There we go. The traditional Jack and Coke for beer Christianity. <laughs> Cheers all. Cheers. Cheers. Hey, and welcome to Beer Christianity. Uh, my name is John T. I'm Drabs. And I'm Laura. And we are currently coming to you from our favorite pub, which is Laura's house. Yeah. Uh, because every freaking place in Dead Cart <laughs> is closed tonight. Every single one of them. And when we're like, oh, it's cool, we'll go and buy some booze, like, in a shop. Yeah. Shops? How, how did that go, Drabs? Oh, wow. The, off the Polish off-license was shut Even for the, the first Polish time ever. Yeah. Just horrendous. Yeah. And to all of those people who say, hey, you only go to two pubs in Dead Cart. We actually went to a third pub and they refused to serve us. They did. I mean, it wasn't like an aggressive thing. It wasn't like <laughs> Larry. I think it was just, um, we've got some music playing in the background. Laura's candle problem is finally coming into its own uh, because she's uh, lit a whole bunch of them because, what did she say? Because... Hashtag self-care. Hashtag self-care. <laughs> so um, she's self-caring for us. And uh, yeah, this episode is all about consumerism and its effects, and that has an interview. What is happening? Moisturizer on. Just putting moisturizer on. Wow, make yourself a home. Lord. Yeah, <laughs> wow. So this episode is all about an interview with Kale Larson. If you don't know who Kale Larson is, he's a freaking legend. He's the founder and editor in chief of Adbusters magazine. He uh, was one of the originators with Adbusters of uh, Buy Nothing Day, Buy Nothing Christmas, and um, one of the instigators of Occupy Wall Street. So, kind of a, a ledge if you're into anti consumption stuff. So, we got an interview with him uh, that I did in about 2008, 2009. Like to apologize in advance for the fact girling um, that I do because a lot of it is pretty justified I think <laughs> yeah, yeah it's justified but it's also yeah, a little justified as a fan girl not for a professional general <laughs> <laughs> it is sickening I'll be honest it's just like so much of it's just like hey so you know I'm kind of on the same page as you I don't know if you know that and you know would you adopt me uh, so well, it just makes this take down all the more brilliant oh yeah no. <laughs> we'll get on to that later we, we, will, we, we will get on to the takedown so I think probably uh, if you've never listened to Beer Christian Hey, welcome. Uh, we are Christians. Where would you where would you place yourself on the whole Christian spectrum, guys? Like, Laura's looking confused. Baptist, I guess. Yeah, oh, you'd be Baptist. a Baptist. Oh, yeah, nice. Yeah. yeah, you are kind of a Baptist, actually. You're, you're, you're kind one of the most Baptist. Baptist people I know. Yeah, yeah. 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 I mean, so I'm kind of I'm kind of a Baptist, but I've been in exile in the Anglican Church for the last for the last decade. But we're we're kind of I, I guess a little bit post evangelical, but whilst yeah. also hating on the post evangelical movement. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Whenever the post evangelicals start hating on the evangelicals, we're like, hey, 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 uh, chill yeah, out. Yeah, and yeah. then like whenever we encounter actual evangelicals, we're like, ooh, yeah, we probably need some liberal in our lives. I think that's kind of the. That's kind of the vibe, really. Yeah, yeah. Um, because uh, I'm, I'm probably more liberal. You've still got truth tattooed in biblical Greek on your arms. So. <laughs> 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 that is a solid comment. Uh, I, I, in fact, do have truth. <laughs> so, yeah, we are kind of... Um, <laughs> basically, we're a Christian podcast. We generally go to pubs. We couldn't find a pub that would take our money tonight. So we're in Laura's living room. Uh, we have a few drinks. We talk about things that affect faith. And one of the most important things to affect faith is the kind of socio-political effect of consumerism. And people like Kale Larson are freaking heroes. So without further ado... Here's Kale. Oh, and my wife made me promise to say to you that um, your book, Culture Jam, changed her life. So, Oh, my uh, God. It's <laughs> <laughs> strange. Uh, lately, um, seven, eight years after publishing the book, 
I've been getting a few people who say something like that to me. It's really, really quite bracing. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it, it really is. Yeah, basically what we're doing is writing a piece about consumerism. Um, and I thought, well, you'd be the natural person to speak to about it. Um, and basically trying to go from a fairly uh, beginner position for people who aren't necessarily already activists um, and who maybe think there's nothing wrong with the world as it is at the moment and kind of, um, yeah, trying to, trying to get a message across about it. Um, so... I, I guess I would open up with asking you how you would define consumerism. Well, just to, just to, just to sort of deturn the, the conversation a little bit, the, I think that uh, that by and large the the world really is tuned out. I, I, I don't, and I think especially uh, I don't know if I should say that, but especially. Christians, in some sense, people who who have a chance to really and an inclination to do something about it, they by and large do tend to be kind of tuned out. I wonder if they're even at the beginner stage. Am, am I wrong there? No, I think you're completely correct. Um, I mean, yeah. there are there have been recent movements towards um, people being a little bit more conscious of 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 the issues, um, yeah. but they're they're currently still at the fringes. We're we're trying to bring them into the mainstream. I think would be the. But I think I think there's still a terror, you know, from the '50s of Christians of like communism and anything even vaguely socially and, conscious and must being be totally uncontroversial and just just yeah yeah absolutely. I think that may you may be right about that yeah. But there anyway. are also a lot of Christians who are who are very much involved in in uh, the grassroots and and also kind of macroeconomic stuff. So yeah. Yeah, but uh, when we first launched uh, Buy Nothing Day uh, over 15 years ago now, then then you know that. Uh, the environmentalists were the first people to sort of jump on board, and then after that, they were the the mental environmentalists, the, the the people who didn't like the advertising that came with our consumer culture. But you know, the third group that actually jumped on board and really started uh, doing uh, buy nothing day and also buy nothing Christmas were the the spiritual people, and, and they were and, and mostly the Christians. I can totally so, believe. So it. there is something there. I think there's a very fertile ground there for, you know, for for Christians to 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 become the the people who take this large perspective view of what's what's going wrong with with our planet right now and really starting to do something about it. Yeah, which was a yeah when that first happened, it was quite a surprise for me because I didn't really expect mainstream people. Um, I don't know for some reason, especially Christians, to jump on board, but they did. Yeah. And then I, uh, over the years, I've analyzed it down to a, this this uh, idea that uh, simplicity and frugality has always been at the base of, of of most religions. I mean, most religions that I can think of, they they all have this simple frugality at the heart of their at, of their ethic, and, and 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 certainly in Christianity that's the case. And so I think that uh, you know, buy nothing day or buy nothing Christmas or or just living a simpler life. Uh, or, or becoming one of the, the the crusaders for a different kind of uh, uh, culture, you know, the, this idea of taking consumer out of culture, out of consumer culture, and just turning it back into a, an authentic bottoms-up culture again. I think this is something that. Uh, I think, yeah, I, I think this is something that could really take off among Christians. Absolutely. Well, I think people like Richard Foster are doing it these days. Um, Thomas Merton was doing it in the 60s, so I can I can imagine right, they're right, doing it yeah, now. So. Yeah. Um, I actually read a Thomas Merton quote in one of the adbusters that came out a, a while ago, and I was very pleased to see that. I thought that was very cool. Yeah, so. right. Yeah. yeah, that's right. Yeah, so, I, I, yeah, so, so maybe jumping the gun on you a little bit, I think that uh, that we're in a in a kind of a very dangerous moment right now, like when we first launched By Nothing Day and when I first wrote Culture Jam, then then the world was still a fairly, you know, fairly sort of a uh, kind of a rational place where where there was still time to to, to think about things and then try to plan a better kind of a future without any any real urgency. But, uh, but since then, of course, I don't have to tell you that, you know, we've had the... Nicola Stern reports warning us of the greatest mm-hmm. market failure the world has ever seen, and then, and we're in a never-ending war against terror that's that's partly fueled by this huge gap between the rich and the poor people of the world, and and and, and in the psychological space where we're now uh, in in places like North America, I think it's almost the same in the UK where we've got between three and five thousand marketing messages a day coming into our brain, and 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 we're in an epidemic of mental illness, so. So ecologically, psychologically, and, and politically, we're yeah, you could almost say that we're sort of hitting the wall. And and uh, uh, so I, I think that uh, 
this idea that uh, you know that spiritual people, whether they're Buddhists or Christians or or, or, or whoever, that for them to sort of turn the, the consumerism, which I think is one of the the roots of, of you know this is the mother of, of of all of those three problems I just described, and and for spiritual people to to come out and become a real force to be reckoned with for the first time. I mean, I mean, for the last, ever since I was a, a little kid over the last 50 years, you know, religion hasn't really, except for a few little skirmishes here and there, it hasn't really played any, any, any meaningful or, or, or visceral or, or, or powerful role in, in shaping our culture. And I don't know mm-hmm. whether you agree with that or not, but it, it's been a kind well, of I think passive, most evangelicals, even on the right, would agree with is you that on right? that. Yeah, because it's, it's been kind of like a passive player. And now I think it's finally time for, you know, for, for uh, spiritual people to, to really start strutting their stuff again. Because I think that the, the spiritual, you know, it's not going to be the economist. It's not going to be the, you know, the business types or the, or, or the executives at that little corporations, you know. I, th- I think it's going to be up to to ask the people uh, to, to, to do something about this problem and to, to take consumer out of consumer culture. And, and, and I've always felt ever since the first few years of Buy Nothing Day that, uh, that, 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 that Christians can really do something about this now. In, uh, and, 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 I, and I've always said that there's a sort of a, uh, you know, that spiritual people, you know, have two faces. One of them is a kind of a, a passive, uh, I'm going to think about this and be nice to everybody, and and and, 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 and you know meditate on the side of a river, and and, and 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 go to church on Sundays, and and be this kind of a very gentle, passive person who who generates wonderful things in this world just by their, you know, by the, the beautiful sort of simplicity and and, and 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 gentleness of their nature. But now I think it's time for a. The other, the other face, the more ferocious face of, if you like, of of, uh, of spirituality to show itself. And throughout history, uh, spirituality hasn't always been the way it's been here for the last 50 years. You know, it's, it's always had two sides of the coin. It's always had the the ferocious face as well as the gentle face. And now I think it's time for uh, for, for that that for ferocious face to be shown again, and for you know for for, for uh, Christians to start uh, you know sh- you know really sort of uh, confronting the the, the 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 status quo in a very visceral way um you were saying that and consumerism is uh, at the root you believe uh, of a lot of the environmental psychological and i guess justice issues of the world yes um, yes c- could you explain that link yes well when it comes to uh, uh, you know the ecological crisis we're in then the the, the link is kind of obvious and and, and uh, um you know the Basically, overconsumption is the the mother of all our environmental problems, really. Uh, and of course, it's. Uh, uh, I mean, we're just uh, as a species, you know, there's six, seven billion of us, and uh, and as a species, we're just consuming too much. Uh, and especially the one billion uh, very rich people in the world, the people who live in the UK and then North America and Australia and Japan and and Europe. I mean, we are we are just one billion uh, about. Uh, uh, you know what is it like twenty percent of the the, the yeah. population of the planet, and yet we consume uh, roughly uh, three quarters or even as much as eighty percent of uh, of the world's resources and and, and we spew out uh, uh, roughly the same amount of the uh, you know the, the toxic uh, chemicals and 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 create uh, about eighty uh, percent of the the waste of the world and the uh, and the carbon and and, and so on so uh, so I think it's 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 quite obvious that especially maybe maybe it's hard to argue that uh, you know to, uh, that this is true in India, but when it comes to the these rich one billion of us, mm. then we we are the problem, and it is our consumerism and our huge footprint, and, and this this denial that we're in that somehow we can fix the problem by changing a few light bulbs and 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 and, and you know occasionally using a bicycle or, or, or buying a hybrid car instead of an SUV or whatever. Mm. We're, we're fooling ourselves. Our footprint is, you know, two or three or four hundred percent bigger than it should be. And we, we have to, you know, if we don't uh, find ways to reduce that footprint, then, you know, then the, 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 the global economy and, and, and the global ecology is going to collapse and force us to do that. Mm. So, so, so here, you know this this link between consumerism and 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 uh, an ecological catastrophe is, is quite obvious. Um, on the psychological front, 
people who have first started off as uh, physical environmentalists have suddenly, you know, uh, quite often because they're stressed out or suddenly they, they're in a, they've got some sort of a low-level mood disorder where they feel in a bit of a funk every morning when they wake up or whatever. Right. All of a sudden they they wake up to the fact that, oh, maybe maybe one of the reasons that's making them feel so lousy and one of the reasons that uh, that make, is making them dash off to the malls all the time and go crazy at christmas and 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 somehow try to fix all their, their their problems by buying another pair of jeans or buying another car or buying another present for their wife or whatever mm. is is actually this this incredible onslaught of of uh, of marketing messages that uh, you know that is forced into our brain every day whether we like it or not uh, if you add it all up the you know the whatever the, the few dozen that you, the adverts that you see on TV and the and the few hundred that you that are popping in your in your face when you're in front of your computer and the billboards you drive by and the, and and all the the logos that we wear on our shoes and our our, our shirts and and and, the, and our buildings and our billboards if you add it all up over a 24 hour period then the number of marketing messages that one way or another get into our brain is is somewhere between three and five thousand mm-hmm. uh, and uh, a few researchers uh, uh, have now postulated that that, that uh, our brains may not be capable of absorbing that uh, number of, of, of very aggressive, quite often very aggressive marketing messages, which are often laced with, with erotic tintillations and, and sometimes even with violent tintillations and quite often the techniques used in, 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 in uh, uh, product marketing are sort of... Uh, blackmail emotional blackmail kind of techniques where where they make you feel lousy about how big your thighs are or how how your skin isn't as smooth and beautiful as it should be or whatever or your hair is lousy or whatever and they and they use this way of of saying hey you've got a problem but we can fix it mm-hmm. <laughs> and uh, and and so 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 that kind of uh, emotional emotionally charged uh, erotically charged uh, advertising could well be one of the the multiple factors that is uh, causing this uh, uh, epidemic increase in mood disorders and anxiety attacks and and depressions that that, that we have now we're in an epidemic of of mental illness uh, the world health organization is telling us that uh, uh, mental disease will be bigger than heart disease in another 10 years or so uh, and we don't know what is causing this uh, uh, this epidemic and yet more and more evidence is coming out that it's, it's that one of the one of the multiple causes is consumer culture itself, which is uh, constantly sort of doing bad things to our brain. Uh, and then when it comes to politics, the the link isn't so obvious here, and many people will disagree with me. But uh, when uh, septem- when 9/11 happened, and we started debating. Uh, about you know what are some of the root causes of of this war on terror that we're forced to fight, and which looks like it may be a, a war that may go on for a long, long time, if not forever. Uh, then many people, uh, myself included, started saying that that well, one of the root causes of this uh, war on terror is this incredible gulf between the the rich and the poor people of the world, where where we, the rich one billion, you know, suck up. Uh, Three quarters of all the goodies on the on the on the planet and then in, in, in the global economy, we leave a lousy twenty twenty five percent to the rest of the five billion people on the planet, mm-hmm. and then we wonder why they hate our guts, mm-hmm. and then we wonder why why so many of them you know uh, decide decide that they're they you know that they're willing to to fight against the empire and and rightly or wrongly well, whatever the reasons are I mean I, I think this huge gap between the rich and the poor people of the world is 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 undoubtedly in my mind one of the root causes of of of, of uh, geopolitical instability and and this uh, and and one of the one of the many causes of this uh, this war on terror that we're in now so so ecologically psychologically and politically i believe that uh, overconsumption and consumerism is at the heart of all three mm. Absolutely. You've mentioned um, advertising and marketing messages and that sort of stuff. Um, in terms of overconsumption, I mean, some people would say, well, even if I don't, you know, give in to advertising, even if I freed myself, assuming that's possible, uh, the fact is that, uh, you know, the sneakers I bought last week will only last a year because that's how they're designed. The toaster I bought last week. I- is there a role for um industry itself and government regulation and all that sort of stuff to play in in uh, the kind of throwaway culture that we've created in terms of what we consume yes of course 
there is. I, I think that uh, we as a, as a society, as a culture, have really dropped the ball where, where you know, all kinds of stuff is thrown at us, whether it's uh, some drugs that don't work or whether it's, uh, you know, appliances that, that don't have enough of a, uh, you know, a life and, 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 and uh, planned obsolescence, which is built right into the very products we buy all the time. And, uh, but but I, quite frankly, um, in the larger realm of things, I think this is a, a minor problem compared to the fact that uh, that for the last couple of generations, you know, we have uh, created a culture in which we rear our children, we teach our children to to have this incredible sense of entitlement that, that we, you know, we, we kids grow up these days, you know, thinking that, that, that they deserve all this stuff and that they, they, they not only, you know, that they, they want to have this 200 pair of sneak, $200 pair of sneakers, and they're buying it not because... You know the fact that it doesn't last for more than a year is is is, is not uh, not such a huge problem as the fact that that people buy it because it somehow you know puts some swoosh into their life or they think it puts some swoosh into their life and and they don't realize that you can't buy swoosh and confidence and that sort of stuff you know you have to earn it and 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 uh, but anyway we've created a culture of of entitlement a culture when we're rearing kids that are that are narcissists uh, and we ourselves. Uh, uh, you know, don't think anything of 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 of, of, of you know going out and, and continually solving our problems by just buying more stuff, uh, and and we don't have much of an outcry against uh, you know the toaster that doesn't last for more than a a year or or mm-hmm. or, or the car that's got a kind of a built-in obsolescence uh, built into the very heart of it. Yeah, so uh, so yeah, so I think that we have a much bigger fish to fry here than than, than just just buying uh, toasters that have a longer life. Absolutely. Um, you you say that you know we've created uh, fairly recently a generation of people who live like this, uh, which suggests that it wasn't always like this. Uh, you, w- when did this start? Well, I think it started soon after the Second World War. I mean, I'm I was born in the middle of the Second World War, and and I remember. Uh, I remember the hard times, but when I was a kid, it didn't feel like hard times. The, you know, they were times where, where, where everybody, including my parents, were forced to, to, to uh, do a lot of the stuff themselves and grow some of their own vegetables and and, and make a lot of their own stuff and and, and buy things that uh, that lasted longer and not to buy stuff that you didn't really need. And and at Christmas time, we 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 made presents for each other, and there was this this wonderful family solidarity and. And then a lot of us went to church. Uh, I remember going to church, you know, before I got disillusioned with Christianity <laughs> for various reasons. I, I went to church and, 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 and there was a kind of a, not only a family solidarity, but a, a community solidarity in which, uh, you know, in which uh, religion played a, a large part. Um, but then soon, soon after, the, after we, so, so to speak, won the, 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 the Second World War, then uh, especially in the United States, I think uh, people went back uh, and suddenly the hard times were over and, and, and uh, the technological revolution was in full swing and cars were coming out and, and people were encouraged to, to buy uh, things, to, to, to buy their own houses and, and advertising became uh, more and more of a dominant part of our lives and, 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 uh, uh, and everybody started, uh, you know, basically jumped onto this, uh, this consumer bandwagon and that's when consumer culture was born. In the in the in the ten twenty years after after the Second World War, between 1945 and and and, uh, and I would say 1965, in that 20 years, that's when consumer culture was born. That's when we, uh, without knowing any better, that's when we allowed uh, consumerism to start dominating our lives, and that's when bit by bit we allowed uh, the family fabric and the community fabric to to diminish, mm. uh, and now. Uh, you know, of course, uh, you know, 30 years after that, we found out that uh, that consumerism, uh, you know, does have this this incredibly dark side to it. And by that time, consumerism was was, you know, by by the by the middle of the 19 uh, by by 1995, you know, by by, by the end of the, the the 20th century, consumerism was the the ethic of 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 our time, mm-hmm. uh, not just in. In, in, in the first world, but, but throughout the whole planet, everybody wanted to, to, to play that consumer capitalist game. Mm. Uh, and uh, and we, we, we came up with all kinds of, uh, uh, of, of, of ways of extending credit to people. So, so you know, like
like my parents, when they didn't have the money, they didn't buy anything. Yeah. And and when we did borrow money, like we, we, we had a mortgage, then we took it very, very seriously. And, and we had a 25-year plan to pay off our mortgage. Whereas now, you know, since uh, one, one of the things that happened in the early days of after the Second World War is that, that credit became looser and looser and looser. And they, first of all, there were lay, layback plans and this plans, and then there were credit cards. And, and, and now... Uh, you know, we, we, we've created a system where, you know, you didn't have to have a penny. You didn't even have to have a job and you could still buy a house, you know, in, in, the, in the U.S. here. And, 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 uh, and we created a credit system that allowed consumer, the consumerist ethic to, 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 to continue, you know, getting bigger and bigger, even if, if the money wasn't there. Um, and, uh, and I don't know, while I'm talking here, it just occurs to me that, of course, right now we're in the middle of that, hopefully that bubble bursting in our faces. And, and maybe this is exactly the moment that we've been waiting for. Maybe, maybe if the bubble bursts and if the pain gets bad enough, uh, and, and if it does turn out to be something uh, akin to the 1920s and 1929 crash, then, then maybe finally this will be a wake-up call. <clears throat> and maybe this is the moment that will be uh, recognized by our children. You know, 20, 30 years down the pike, this was the moment when consumer culture, you know, turned the corner and, and became, uh, you know, turned back into a more of a sane, sustainable culture again. Mm. Um, I mean, you are in, in, in your book and, and in the magazine, you are quite critical of traditional uh, lefty, if you like, kind of ideologies. I'm assuming you're not picturing um, a, a communist utopia. Um, what, what's your what's your ideal of what society could be? Yeah, I must admit, I've been saying for years that we have to jump over the dead body of the old left. Mm. Uh, but nonetheless, I think that, uh, you know, I think we have to jump over the dead body of, of the old Christianity as well. So, um, but I do believe that both in Christianity and in, in 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 the in the left, I think there are certain ideals, certain ethics, certain emotions that I can't let go of. Uh, I, when I was going to university, then then the political left was there was a very powerful camaraderieship. It was, you know, most of my friends were, were idealists who, who believed in a some sort of a utopia. And, 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 uh, and, and somehow I, I still believe in, in some of those uh, emotional kind of signatures that, that the left has given me and imprinted on me. And I, and I don't think that for the rest of my life I'll ever be able to let them go. So I, I still, in some sense, believe in the left. But I think that just like Christianity, I think the, the left has, has seriously lost its way and lost its soul. Uh, and uh, so I'm, my 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 future um, is is actually uh, it's a kind of an anarchist future, uh, uh, sort of a radical democratic anarchist future where where uh, people are deciding their own destiny very much on the local level. Uh, there's very powerful communities uh, that, that decide, you know, whether they want the McDonald's to come into their community and, and to what extent they're going to help the, 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 the farmers that are in their community to sort of sell their stuff. And, 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 uh, and if there's an economic downturn, how will they help uh, businesses, you know, to survive in, the, in their own community and, uh, and to, to, to have, uh, uh, you know, to maybe, to maybe to decide to have their own money, even if, if some uh, communities want to do that. And, uh, and to to basically have politics sort of bubble up from the, the from the people again. It, 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 this is this is my vision of the future, and, and not to have um, not to have this sort of a top down world where where, for example, in in the world of sneakers or in the world of music or in the world of cars, you know, we've got half a dozen huge mega corporations that kind of have 90% of the market share and when you want to buy a pair of sneakers then you basically choose between a, a Nike or an Adidas or a Reebok and that's about the size of it and, uh, and, and when it comes to getting your information then, then uh, you know of course there's all kinds of opportunities now on the internet to get your information in other ways but nonetheless you still have half a dozen huge media mega corporations that control more than half of all the, the news and, inf and information flows on the planet uh, and, and so we have a in, in many ways, and we have a global economy that's that's basically controlled by a, you know, just a few hundred very large corporations, and 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 and, and the, you know the World Bank and and, and and the World Trade Organization, and so on. They're very much controlled by a, a small number of, of very powerful financial people, uh, uh, many of them in the United States and the UK. <clears throat> so my dream of a new world is where we, the people, 
take back the initiative, take back the power, start changing certain rules, start imposing, sure, on, on that global level, still, still, you know, implement the Tobin tax perhaps and, and then start, uh, you know, launching antitrust actions against the media mega corporations and, 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 uh, and, and, and start uh, having two cost markets, you know, where, where the price of every product tells the ecological truth. But above all, to have vibrant bioregions and to have vibrant communities within those bioregions that are living sane, sustainable lives as a community. Hmm. Do you feel that um, consumer capitalism has given us anything positive? Well, yes. I, it's sort of a strange question, but I, I think... I think it, it, it has. I think, uh, you know, at a time where we didn't know really what the hell we were doing, I think consumer capitalism, or, or you can call it globalization, if you like, or, 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 or call it the, the beginning of the, the, the global economy or whatever, I think uh, consumer capitalism gave us this uh, global system that, uh, for, for whether we like it or not, that we had to sort of evolve into. Uh, and of course, I think it's gone way too far, and we've given too much power away, and all the rest of it. But I think that um, that you know the the fact that we do have uh, the beginnings of of a, some sort of a global governance, that we do have the beginning of a of a global system, with all its flaws, you know, uh, I think that this 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 is something positive because uh, I don't think that uh, we want to go back into the dark ages, you know, where all these communities all around the world sort of live their own little private lives and don't give a damn what's happening across the river or don't give a damn what's happening across the ocean. I think we are now one unit. I think we, the six, seven billion people on the planet, we are one unit. And and, uh, and we have to start forming, you know, a unitary spirituality and a unitary global systems and, and unitary global markets where every product tells the ecological truth, etc., etc. We do have to operate on both levels. Mm. You know, we have to operate on the global level and we have, have to operate on that community local level. And uh, this is something that has to grow out of your own life. Uh, you know, you have to wake up one morning and just feel lousy and, and decide to do something about it. Or you, one day, you know, maybe this Christmas, you just have to feel that that the, the sort of Christmases that you've been celebrating with your kids and with your with your family for the last 10 years, that it's just been plain wrong. And, 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 and this year you're going to celebrate the Christmas in a wholly different way. Uh, and uh, and you, you have to decide that, uh, that you're going to, uh, you know, start, uh, you know, stop going to the, the supermarket uh, as much as you do and, and start buying way more of your stuff from, you know, from, from local farmers and so on. And unless you decide to do it yourself, then, then, then you're copping out. You're kind of saying, well, I'm not really all that totally convinced. I'm not really, my, you know, my heart isn't really in it. So please help me. Well, I'm not going to help you. <laughs> but what about the people who, who just, they haven't, they haven't got an idea. They want to do a better thing. They buy what you're saying, but maybe they don't have the, the knowledge that you do. That, don't you think you have, a, you have a, a role to play? I mean, you must do. Well, yes, of course. I mean, I wrote a book it. and I've got a magazine. And, yeah. and if people suddenly, you know, find that this is a, an assistance to them, mm. great. But ultimately... Uh, that, that big step from becoming a, a person who makes a positive contribution to the world or the person who makes a negative contribution, if you know, either you become a part of that consumer culture or you become part of a new culture, I think ultimately uh, this, this uh, you know, sort of somehow uh, asking somebody else how it should be done. I, I do, I may have said what I just said a little bit too strongly, but uh, I, I do believe that, uh, that it's not going to work unless it's an epiphany that you yourself have. Mm. And it, you know, you can read the right books, and you can, uh, and above all, the biggest epiphanies come from, from suddenly looking over at uh, your neighbour or looking over at some kid in, in your class that's sitting next to you, or, 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 and suddenly seeing somebody who is spiritually charged up and, and living a full life and, and enjoying life to the hilt and, 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 and doing life in a whole different way from what you're doing, and suddenly saying, wow. What's going on here? Am I missing something? And, and then, I mean, I think that's how the process begins, you know. Uh, and it doesn't begin by somebody saying, well, I think the first thing you should do is, uh, you know, uh, X, Y, Z. And, you know, prescriptions don't work. And I've been in this business for, <clears throat> I started that buses almost 20 years ago now, and I can tell you, Prescriptions don't work. We have had a lot of prescriptions in Adbusters, and we've tried to tell people what to do. It never works. Okay. Fantastic. Do you ever lose hope? Um, 
you know that until about uh, four or five years ago, <clears throat> I uh, I was one of these people who grew up in a in a physical environment, you know, fishing in rivers and <clears throat> jumping around and playing with snakes in Australia and whatnot. And I think I'm, I was one of the lucky few who sort of didn't grow up in this sort of a crazy, cynical, digital, electronic environment that so many people grow up in the, these days. And I, I was a 100% sort of this, this optimistic person. There was not a not a cynical fiber to my being, you know. And yet, you know, at the, in in my early 60s, when those uh, Nicholas Stern reports started coming out, and when you know, when, when those scientific reports started coming out warning that there's not going to be any more edible fish in the sea by the, by the year uh, 2048. Uh, and when I looked around me and started wondering about, you know, what the fuck have I really uh, achieved in, in, in 20 years of putting out Adbusters and, and launching Buy Nothing Day? And, and I suddenly realized that, that in these 20 years, you know, we've actually gone backwards. Yeah. Uh, and then... For the first time in my life, I did start feeling a little blue myself waking up in the morning. Mm-hmm. And, 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 and for the moment, uh, I'm now struggling to sort of <clears throat> regain that sort of unmitigated uh, uh, optimism that I had when I was a little bit younger. You're probably not going to be turning to Prozac for that, though. Well, I sure hope not. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, my, my feeling has always been that, uh, that if you... Uh, you know, if you feel yourself uh, going into the dumps a little bit, then then you have to reconnect with the world, and reconnect with your friends, and reconnect with your your family members, and reconnect with the world rather than re- rather than start taking pills. Absolutely. Um, a, a final question, just for for uh, for people like me who uh, are Christians and who and who do respect a lot of what you say, and who have had you know their lives impacted just by being made aware of of the impact of consumerism on the world and on themselves and, yeah. and all that. Uh, I, you speak a lot about like um you know over the dead body of Christianity, but also of it losing its way. Do you think there is a place in in your uh, in your future world in your utopia, um, in my utopia. for people my of faith, my or our utopia, utopia, the one that you discussed? Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. Oh, um, uh, for for yeah. people of faith. Uh, what was the last sentence? For uh, do you think there's a place in in that world for people of faith, or for people of uh, the kind of of the Christian faith, or of or of the Muslim faith, whatever? Or does it have to yes. be a a kind of uh, an amalgam? Well, no, I, I I absolutely believe this is this is actually one of the the positive things that I really believe in right now that gives me some some strength because I I, I believe that uh, that just like the the political left, you know, lost its soul, and now there's a big struggle to gain its soul. I believe that in the world of spirituality, perhaps a little bit less so in Buddhism than in Christianity at the moment, uh, and a few other religions, I, I believe that uh, that, that uh, Islam still has a, a very powerful sort of a, kind of a frugality uh, ethic to it. Like, uh, I, th- I think there's more social ethics and more community values in, in Islam right now than there is in Christianity. Uh, and, and I'm very, very, very um, disappointed and, 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 and down, spiritually down, because of what the, the Catholic Church has done recently, Heine, and it's, it's refusal to sort of really step up and, 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 uh, and deal with this, this, uh, this uh, sexual abuse uh, mm-hmm. thing that's been simmering now for almost uh, 20, 30 years. I mean, that, that has been a real downer for me. I just can't believe that, uh, you know, that, uh, that, that the Catholic Church... Uh, is playing politics with, with that issue to the extent that it that it is. Uh, but having said all that, I I, I believe. In, in fact, I would go almost so far as to say that ultimately, if there's going to be some sort of a sane, sustainable future, then it, it's going to be the, the the spiritual people, and I include myself among them. Even though I don't call myself a Christian or a Buddhist, but I do believe uh, that there is a mystery to this uh, mm. life that I'm living in, and that I will never totally understand it. And I'm and I and I'm and I'm willing to, and and I believe that there's some sort of a, a larger uh, some sort of a larger uh, thing happening there, whether you want to call it God or whatever. Uh, I don't really know, and I don't even want to much talk about it. But I I am a spiritual person myself, and I believe that we spiritual people, and that includes people like me, uh, as well as uh, you know Christians and and and, and Buddhists and, and and other people of faith. I believe that we may actually be the only people that have what it takes and who have that sort of a, uh, that that sort of a spiritual base that that will allow us to 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 be 
be the people who, uh, and equip us to be the people who, who finally turn things around. Kelly, thank you very much. It has been uh, very inspiring and a pleasure to talk to you. So. Delighted. I, yeah, yeah. I sort of got myself all worked up there. And now I feel a lot better too. <laughs> <laughs> it's really great. Thank you so much for taking the time. And uh, okay, adios. And 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 and, and give a pat on your to, to, uh, to give your wife a pat on the back for me. <laughs> Guys, what did you think of Calais? What a flipping legend! I, I I love Calais, and for me, that hearing that interview reminded me. Do you, do you ever like hear the gospel preached, mm. and it kind of takes you back to your conversion? Yeah, that was that for me. Yeah, it's like all saying stuff that you already know and that you yeah. already like vibe with, and it's just like like I, I think you said before the thing you were just like I mean hey Calais yeah, I'm single, Calais, I'm single <laughs> like you know hit me up you know I've always wanted to listen. <laughs> He's, uh, he's phenomenal, and he just speaks so much sense. Uh, that was recorded around 2009. Kind of depressing. Same as the Shane Claiborne thing that we did a few episodes ago. Just kind of depressing. Oh, it broke my heart when he was like, oh, this could be the moment. This could be the moment it all changes. Look at look at where consumerism and aggressive un- unregulated capitalism has got us in this current economic crisis. It's just, <laughs> just like, oh, yeah. Oh, and like, oh, people sad. will finally, like, they'll notice and they'll rise up and everything will change. And I'm like, oh, oh. dude, they voted for Donald Trump. Yeah. Like, it's like when he's like, um, say he's only recently got sad... It's like, oh, what is, mm. how sad must he be now? Oh. Just heartbreaking. So he, he also was like, you know, well, we really haven't seen religion playing much of a role in public life in the West. Oh, wow. And like the evangelicals putting Trump in the White House yeah. and and still trying to sanctify his sin, which I, you know, I'm actually all for them. You know what? This is a thing. Okay, so when Clinton, uh, the male Clinton, was in office, <laughs> male, uh, Clinton. male Clinton. You know, whatever. They're both they're both the same kind of right center uh, people. But um, when he was in office. I did find it really uncomfortable when Christians were like, the most important thing, though, is his character. And how can we have somebody who's immoral in the White House? And I was just like, I don't fundamentally care about his personal morality. I care about the policies that he's going to enact. And I don't care that Donald Trump is, you know, uh, unfaithful to his wife. I don't. I, it means nothing to me. I do care that he is trying to subjugate women generally and that he is a racist and a misogynist, but mainly because he's letting that slip into his, you know, policies. If he didn't let it slip into his policies, I'm not his dad, you know? I don't fundamentally care. And I find Christian politics that that has that kind of attitude just a little bit, you know, paternalist and bizarre. I don't know. What do you guys think? I have the same argument with my dad every time an election rolls around and he talks about um, the, the character of his MP. And, and, and it mostly annoys me because he's voted Tory for the last four <laughs> elections. When he's like the most left-wing guy I know like honestly in his heart he's such a socialist but but he doesn't like the character of the of the Labour candidate or whatever each time and so votes for for the Tory and I'm like sure like the most important thing is how they're voting and if they're voting along manifesto lines yeah and what then then what matters Um, ideology guys ideology I know Zizek says ideology and eating from the trash can of ideology and all that (laughs) kind of stuff also if anyone looks like a person who's eaten from the trash can of anything it would be Zizek who I love but you know that man I saw something online that said he's he's a feral raccoon and (laughs) And and he is, but but we love him. Um, Calais talks about wanting Christianity. Also, just how amazingly wonderful to have somebody who is a representative of the anarchist left being so positive about spiritual people and religious people and wanting them to be more ferocious. Like, I find that really interesting. Again, maybe maybe it's pre-evangelical supporting Trump but and pre-Tea Party, but I find that beautiful. I find it beautiful. I, I, I th- it was sad, the disconnect that he um, talked about between the, what he believed Christianity could achieve and then when he went on to say, well, Christianity has, has really lost its soul, mm. <laughs> which was a sad moment. Yeah, yeah. I, I have to say, though, I don't... I don't know that I can see... I don't know, especially... Specifically, like more Western Christians rising up in the way that he's kind of suggesting that we should, just mostly because like the the narrative in the church at the moment is like you know we need to be listening to uh, like the world church, we need to be like you know Ooh. stepping back from our power and stuff like that, and actually you like you know in that 
when he when he's talking about that in his interview, he's not referring to like you know the, the minor, minority Christians in you know across the world. He's talking about the Western Christians who have had had that immense power over culture and are now having to kind of step back from that influence. So yeah, I don't I don't know that I can. I, I, it's sad, but I, I don't know that I could ever see that kind of the ferocity of Christianity coming back. True, but actually, interestingly, now that you say that, the last time we probably saw that real ferocity perhaps might have been in the liberation theology movement in, in Latin America. Yeah. And if you haven't read up on that, then, then please yeah. do. But that was hugely influenced by a, a kind of anti anti kind of oppressive capitalism coming coming from the West. Um, yeah. So yeah. Um and and I think there is an element of of yes, you know, western Christianity is doing that. I don't think the majority of western Christianity is really going we need to lay our power down. <laughs> like I, I don't I don't think <laughs> not, not feeling yeah, that. Every <laughs> every time I get a little bit freaked out by that because I also I don't buy this power corrupts narrative. I don't think it's no, true. It corrodes, doesn't oh, it? it corrodes. <laughs> As Justin Welby said, if his people would let us publish the freaking interview, you would hear that. Point is, um, I don't think that that's actually going to happen particularly. I also don't think that it's particularly helpful. Laying down your power, I understand why anarchists think that dominative power is in itself some kind of negative thing. I myself am a socialist and believe that centralized power is quite useful, and I think the power is going to exist everywhere. And if you, if you cede power... Somebody will come in and take it. And in our society, that will be some kind of oligarch, that will be some kind of multinational corporation. It will be the wealthy and the powerful who will step in. For me, I would far rather see power being wielded well and, 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 in, and, and to see a ferocious Christianity come up that isn't going, yes, we are ferocious because we are different and we're going to impose our morality on you, on your personal sexual life or on... I don't know, some kind of random stuff. Mostly, I would love for Christians to be standing up and being more ferocious and going like, you know what, we're not going to just be the guys who make our faith attractive to you by saying we're not that different from you. I think we're going to be the guys who say our faith is attractive because we offer something better. So you say we should kill our enemies. We say fuck that shit. You're supposed to love your enemies. You know, like we are different. We're meant to be different. We're not just meant to go, hey, don't worry, we're not that different. We're pretty much the same as you. Um, I don't think we're a sleeping giant. I think we're a lazy giant, you know? I think that's the problem. Hell yes. And Hell so yeah. what from this interview then are we taking away that in, in terms of what would Frosty look like for us? I think taking a ferocious attitude to the things he talks about. I think it's um, it's greed, right, Laura? That's yeah. That's the issue. Yeah, it's like, it's... It's recognizing when greed is taking over your life, I think, and making a conscious effort to step back from that and showing that you're being making an example of that, and so like and encouraging others to step back and stuff like that. And I think I have said, I think I've said in previous podcasts about how like, uh, like it's in terms of like the environmental crisis and stuff like that. Like, I think it is our it is kind of our duty as Christians to protest at this point. It's our way of. It's the only way left, really, to protect like our planet and stuff like that. So I think, yes, stepping back from from consumption and like showing that, but also actively fighting it is also very, very important. I think the greed thing is really interesting because as you were talking, I was I was trying to think of my own life about when I give in to consumption and buy shit I don't need. I wonder if it's got to the stage in the West where a lot of that is just apathy or boredom or because we think it's what we're meant to do like yeah. or because i'm just not thinking i'm being lazy rather than like it, it doesn't feel like the monster of greed is rising up in me maybe at some conscious level i don't know i don't know what do you think on that uh i think it's not a, a coincidence that the magazine was called ad busters and that a lot of what they did was to go out and deface billboards and adverts in public spaces because they considered advertising brain damage yeah. um I think since the 40s, since Edward Bernays um, uh, getting involved in uh, creating the, the science of uh, publicity and public relations, mm -hmm. using psychology to manipulate people into buying things they didn't need in order to prop up banking institutions that needed credit cards to work, the invention of the department store, the eventual ev invention of the supermarket, um, advertising based 
far less on telling you what the product did and how it met your need and far more on creating a need, creating a brand. I mean, hell, we all work in communications. We understand this. Um, and when Bill Hicks said, if you work in marketing or communications, go and kill yourself. No, I'm not joking. Like that cut me deep. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we're working for charity, so I feel <laughs> like we're doing some of that, you know, for good. But I think advertising and its kind of proliferation in our culture means that you're driving this engine of consumption. You're telling people again and again, if you don't consume, you don't you don't matter. You're not good enough. It's not just, we all talk, always talk about this in the fashion industry and in the beauty industry of making women feel worthless if they don't consume. It isn't just women. There is an, there is an overwhelming kind of attack on women and it is gendered. But I think generally speaking, we find it almost impossible to have any experience that isn't in some way mediated by a financial transaction uh you know or consuming something we're hanging out this entire podcast is built around well you can't really just have a conversation you have to drink something but to be fair it's just because other podcasts are dull Um, (laughs) but but i think as christians we need to recognize that greed is a sin And that consuming more than you need is a sin. I say this as a fat man, so I'm not judging other people without judging myself. Like, and, and the problem for me is not that it is personal greed. The problem is that it is systemic. Yeah. Capitalism is based on what they call rational self-interest, but what it is is greed. If people stopped consuming, the engine would slow, stagnate, and fail. Yeah. Um, our system requires greed. That cannot be a righteous system 100% and, and and as well because of the impact that it's having on some of the poorest people in the world and, and really interesting in, in, in the Calais interview was the link with the war on terror and is Schumacher perhaps um, said, E.F. Schumacher yeah, yeah. E.F. Schumacher that's right um, talked about whenever you've got a, a kind of economy that, that's built on people over consuming consuming more than the, the, than they are the, than their kind of planet share if you like if you want to take that analogy then that's going to necessitate a, a greater area of land than the population, if you like, which means the acquisition of land in another place or, or, the, or the use of land in another place, which inevitably will have to lead to war. Absolutely. And when you think of that in terms of most recent wars and in oil-rich nations, because oil undergirds so much of our uh, of our economy. More than just the cars that we think about, eh? Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Because we, we think about petrol, but what we're talking about is all plastics. Yeah. What we're talking about is all fertilizer. Um, Every, everything relies on oil and and yeah speaking of oil and fertilizer could we turn to the beer that we're drinking oh <laughs> my goodness so look as a as a podcast that focuses on beer we're not you know massively into beer we're not beer nazis <laughs> i wouldn't even say we have a, a lot of taste um and i would say i'm pretty we drink cars 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 um sometimes but this shit <laughs> Uh, well, it, it's called a, a, a brew dog, and brew dog, brew dog. God damn, we've been good to you. We have. <laughs> we have not accepted a penny in return. Like we have told everybody that we're drinking brew dog. We've drunk so much freaking brew dog, and frankly loved it. But what were you thinking with this garbage? This is from the Citrus Sessions. Um, apparently, it's a Citrus Session IPA. It's called the Clockwork Tangerine. It is. In the words of my Scottish friend, pish. This is not good. Wow. Do you ever have a, a Terry's chocolate orange? Now, no one likes a Terry's chocolate orange, but you still No, it's like always garbage. garbage. Right? Always garbage. Always garbage. Yeah. But now imagine... <laughs> I haven't had the middle bit of a Terry's chocolate orange. It's, That's it's, like it's, the it's, same it's, 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 it's air. Have you had the it's middle bit of a donut? No, 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 no. <laughs> the, middle, the middle of a Terry's chocolate orange hits different. Oh, uh, really? Oh, oh yeah. wow. Okay. okay. Let's hey, do you want to have some of this? This shit is for you. I love this. Oh, it's so bad. Like, I like Elvis Juice, which is the grapefruit one yeah um, that's all right that's yeah, excellent yeah. this is terrible yep. this is genuinely terrible whether or not you like a chocolate orange do not drink clockwork tangerine it's awful so instead we're drinking what is this heineken by the way that's how long it should take you to open a can <laughs> uh, fy it's like that it just takes that long weak nails you have weak nails <laughs> So, in terms of the Calais interview, other stuff that struck you about the whole consumerism thing, uh, what about the mental health aspect of it and, like, what 
consumer capitalism is doing to our mental health because I thought it was kind of brave of him to go uh, hey you know you should go outside and have a walk because I know that that kind of advice can be taken quite badly by people um, I don't think he means oh mental health doesn't need drugs ever but I think Adbusters has been quite skeptical of over prescription of uh, antidepressants particularly well some thoughts on that I think he's absolutely I think we're absolutely right in saying that like Mental issues, health. Oh, mental issues. Mental issues. <laughs> mental issues. Ah, <laughs> uh, like I don't know whether I can go as far to say as a direct result of consumerism, but like, yeah, kinda. Like. Yeah. Well, if you're, you're not- if you're in a if you're in a job in which you are treated like basically a machine or yeah. a beast of burden, yeah. where nothing of your humanity is recognised, where your position is incredibly precarious, you have no autonomy within it, you are treated as a unit that produces, and you are nothing about your work is interesting, has variety, has creativity. Like, you are the base, you are the base of of capitalism. You are the base of that kind of production. You are about to be replaced by machines, but currently you're cheaper than putting in a machine because that's how low the wages have gone. To, To feel depressed in that situation, to feel depressed that even if you're working two jobs, you can't really adequately care for your family, and society says that's fine and if you complain about it if you strike it, you're the problem mm-hmm. i i'm going to say that that that's not depression that's having a really fucking horrible life yeah. and what it does is actually result in depression it yeah. does actually trigger the actual disease of of, yeah. of depression and mental health issues and i think it can also be the unhealthy attitude towards of like oh i'm I must buy more things to fill the hole in my life that I've currently experiencing. Like, that's not healthy. Putting your validation into material things is not a healthy thing to do and constantly comparing yourself to others using social media and stuff like that, like, you know... One of the things that the the Calais interview hit me really hard about was um, you guys probably know that I'm not super active on... On, on social media platforms that kind of connect with people. Um, <laughs> I, you're not you're not super active. So probably the, the the social media platform I spend the most time scrolling through is one called HUKD, um, which is a kind of community of people who post uh, uh, deals. It's called Hot UK Deals. <laughs> Oh, don't laugh! I'm doing a confession here. Sorry, sorry. This is, is this not how Catholic, is, is this not how Catholic priests do it? <laughs> <laughs> do you not even start with "Forgive me, Father, for us"? <laughs> oh, to this guy! Wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no one, no one's gonna feel that. Oh God, I've been That's joking. <laughs> Man, it cut me hard. Like, I have seriously cut back because really? it's like, mm. like it's everything Calais mm. speaking against. Yeah. Like, because it is the consumerism. It is the, no. this is the thing, is we're in a society where if you, uh, we, we live in a society, um, but, we, <laughs> but we are, we are, we are in, in a society where our worth is based on what we own and our experience of life is based not necessarily on whether even people see it, but on just the experience of buying it. And like, I'm a lefty man. Like I've, I've been reading Adbusters for ages, but when I feel bad, when I feel bored, I just want to go out and like, I have a real urge whenever I take a road trip to go and buy a Red Bull and some crisps. It doesn't matter whether I'm hungry or not. It's just kind of become a tradition. Yeah, yeah. It's it's buying as tradition. It's um. We got fashion in there as well. Your your identity based on a brand, based on having new clothes every season, every month, every fucking week. And you actually asked um, Calais about this in terms of planned obsolescence. Yeah. And, and he slapped you like the little fan sl- you <laughs> He slapped me by like a small <laughs> bitch. Uh, <laughs> he did. Um, I think he's wrong. Um, I think he's naive. I think, sure, people don't buy new phones because their phone has stopped working. Um, I do think people buy cars because their cars stop working. And then we throw those cars away, in this country particularly. And 
And yes, in terms of road safety, we bring in MOTs and roadworthy certificates and all we that kind of stuff. We also bring in the scrappage scheme, which is a financial incentive to throw your car away to fuel the car production industry. Absolutely. Um, people's uh, obsession with getting a new kitchen. How can a kitchen not be a kit? It's a kitchen. How can it? I mean, like, you say that, I think you're referring like, to kitchen units rather than appliances. I mean, there is planned obsessions in appliances. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. Uh, Point is the idea. Okay, so as a Christian, for people who are listening to this as Christians who have never actually engaged with the idea of wait a minute, so consumption is a bad idea because you hear us a lot of like, uh, well, we don't want our churches to be consumer spaces. You know, you need to participate. And I'm like, actually, no. I showed up to be taught, so teach me. But like. What about like in our in our lives? <laughs> Drives is, is he has problems with that. <laughs> I, you know what I hate? I hate when people are like, "Hey, why don't you break up into small groups?" Or like, "Hey, you don't want to hear me standing at the front and talking." Yes, I do. That's why I came here. I want to hear from somebody smarter than me who studied theology, not Gladys next to me who doesn't know shit. <laughs> actually. Like and just, by gla- let's say Fred, obviously just, let's not gender that. Oh, like, yeah, yeah. Yeah. we'll just pause there and say that the John T has some issues with participatory learning. Oh my goodness, <laughs> I fucking hate participatory learning. Why? Why? What a waste of. Like, it's such... Why do I want to hear your garbage ideas? Why do you want to hear my garbage ideas? Why don't we listen to somebody who knows something? Yeah, um, you can get in touch with us at any time to give us your thoughts on this podcast. We'd love to discuss your opinions. We would not. Um, <laughs> okay, that's an ironic touch, I'll admit, I'll admit, I'll admit. Okay, okay. By the way, if you do want to get in touch, what better time to say get in touch than now and say we are actually ridiculously responsive to people who get in touch. We've bought people in other countries beers yeah. because they got in touch. So get in touch, uh, beerchristianity at yahoo.com. You can get in touch with us on Twitter at beerxianity. Um, uh, we're also on YouTube, on Instagram, uh, yeah, all sorts of places. Just, you know, look for us. Yeah, we're, we're going to get on HUKD as of next week. <laughs> oh, <laughs> dude. Also, the moment somebody gives us sponsorship, we are there. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the point is, letting the shit own your soul, that's not a good idea. Yeah. Basically, that's what we're saying, yeah. right? Yeah. I think that's what we're saying. I think that's what Jesus said as well. <clears throat> in uh, Matthew, in the Sermon on the Mount. Yeah, yeah. Uh, do not store up for yourself treasure on earth where, where, the, where the moth eats and the rust destroys. And the rust moths eat The rust moths, destroy. yes. The, yeah, yeah. the dangerous, rust dangerous guys. rust moths. Scary. Yeah, yeah. Um, but store up for yourselves treasure in heaven um, because where your treasure is there, your heart will be also. Ab so freaking lutely. Yeah, and also, you know, the old rich man... It's hard for a rich man to get into heaven than cowl through the eye of a needle. Is that yeah, right? camel might have been a camel. It's a camel a more than a cow. <laughs> Definitely a camel. I think De- camel. Like you one, just... like one hundred percent a camel. And at this point, like in most evangelical churches, you're gonna have somebody going like, "Well, actually, there was the camel gate and or no, the needle okay, gate know, or something like that." Saying. Which is just like, like I mean, they might you as well be going saying, like, "You understand the metaphor?" Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> we do, we do. You know, call and response. If you're in a kind of fundamentalist or evangelical or um, charismatic church, you probably don't know call and response. But if you're in a more kind of liturgical space, you will know call and response where somebody says one thing and everybody says something else. I think the biggest call and response in a lot of Christian churches is the passage where of the rich young ruler. Jesus says... Um, to the rich young Eula, ruler who's done it, Eula, the, it's a, that's at Christmas, obviously. Um, the rich young ruler says, you know, I've done all these good things. What else do I need to do to get the kingdom of heaven? And he goes, well, you need to sell everything that you have and give it to the poor. And then the call and response is that gets read. And then the pastor will go, obviously, that's not for everybody. That's a, have you ever heard that preached? where it hasn't been followed by, obviously that's not for everybody. Now let me contrast that just to, so that you don't think I'm being silly. Have you ever heard the woman caught in adultery being told to go and sin no more? Have you ever, <laughs> ever heard somebody preach, um, obviously that's not for everybody. <laughs> like some of us caught in adultery could probably just carry on. Um, no, of course not because our churches preach sexual immorality as far more important and far more central than economic 
immorality and the injustice between the rich and the poor, even though the law, the prophets, the Old Testament and the New talk far more about economic injustice than they do about sexual immorality. Not to say that sexual immorality is anything other than fun. No, anything <laughs> other <laughs> than sin. But it, let's be honest, it kills a lot fewer people in the end. Okay, so <laughs> Kelly did some really interesting stuff in the interview talking about um, the political left and about Christianity and about things they had in common, like both having lost their soul. And I wonder if we have any comments about... Uh, uh, similarities, differences, stuff we can learn from each other? Uh, I think we've lost our soul in that uh, the mainstream of Christianity, and he calls, by the way, when he talks about Christianity and he says, you know, like mainstream people, I was just like, oh, wow, that's heartbreaking. Yeah. Like, we're not meant to be mainstream. If we are mainstream, that's a problem. We've lost, it's really easy for people like us to go, ah, oh, Trump supporting Christians. But how would we convince a Trump supporting Christian that they'd lost their soul, that they'd moved away from the Jesus that we worship because we're not better than them you know we, 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 we've had slightly different upbringings or, or that sort of stuff so in that way progressive Christianity may have lost its soul a little bit as well um, I think we probably have something to teach the left in terms of our purity tests and shibboleths and our desire to exclude anybody who doesn't agree with us entirely and I mean, the left is so guilty of this, obviously. Yeah, I think that would be the biggest lesson we can learn. And also, the lesson we could learn from the left is that becoming the self-hating left does not help you. Yeah. Um, so in our mission, as we recognize the sins of Christianity, the idea of going, okay, cool, so I guess, especially Western Christianity, we have nothing to offer. Um, rather than going, we need to make sure that we're doing this right, I think is probably going to mean that we lose more ground and actual evil will will dominate yeah. probably acknowledgement as well and and i don't know the full history of the political left but but certainly in the uk well, it was born out of christianity uh, i definitely heard a, a a christian from a former soviet state saying that marxism was you know was only necessary historically because christians abandoned their duty to the poor which yeah. i think is wow. interesting uh, yeah Good place to be. Um, I think we need to go because we have definitely been talking for too long. You've probably been listening for more than an hour, which is, I mean, your dedication. If you're still here, congratulations. You, you're a great person. What a star. And a good friend. And a yeah. good friend. Thank you for hanging out with us. Yeah. Um, thanks so much for listening. You've been listening to Beer Christianity. You can find all of the previous episodes at beerchristianity.libsyn.com. L-I-B-S-Y-N, F-Y-I. No, that's unhelpful. <laughs> L-I-B-S-Y-N dot com. Um, and you can find us on Twitter, Beer Xianity, and you can email us at beerchristianity at yahoo.com. So do get in touch. Do ask us um, what you want us to discuss. And ask Ben to buy you a beer. Ask Ben to buy you a beer. Tell John to your favourite participatory learning method. <laughs> tell, me, t- tell me how I need to paint my feelings about Jesus. And let uh, me know if you're single. Absolutely. <laughs> and Laura, Laura needs some single cool Christians out there. Um, or non-Christians, you know, no, no judges. I don't know. I don't know what your standards are here. At this point, anything goes. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much for listening. Uh, we love you guys. Bye. Bye. Bye.